right, so I'd like to uh, start by introducing our first speaker. This is Mr. Brian Egg. Hello, everybody. Uh, Brian is... <laughs> I've known him now for, what, about three, four years? Something like that? Quite, Five years, yeah. Cool. Um, so he's a uh, really talented artist, and I first had the pleasure of getting to know him on a project, reconstructing a new type of horned dinosaur. Um, one of the great things as a paleontologist, I don't want to make the whole introduction just about me, uh, but working with artists is you really get to see the world and the prehistoric animals from a completely different set of eyes. Uh, and he is just a master of bringing the past back to life, capturing all those little details uh, that really make things click and pop. Uh, he has a background, just an amazing background in everything from practical effects through to, uh, to you know, coming out television productions to uh, doing art in collaboration with scientists and collaboration with uh, the Bureau of Land Management and a number of other people. So with that, I'll turn it over and let him tell you a little bit about what he does. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. So like Andy said, my name is Brian Ng, and I make monsters come to life. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, some science-based monsters. But so, you know, the word monster can have a lot of different meanings. And, um, you know, in the case of, uh, like, human mythology and history, I, I find monsters to be really fascinating because, like, you know, demons and vampires and uh, trolls and the weird creatures from human storytelling Monsters embody ideas. So here we have some, some creatures I designed. Um, you know, in, in Norse mythology, we have Fenrir, the great wolf, that seems to embody the ultimate demise of everything. Even, even the great chieftain Odin will soon be eaten by the great wolf. And so this beast embodies an idea. In this case, it's linked to nature. Um, also, the Cyclops in Greek mythology is a great example of something that it embodies kind of a, a social idea. In Greek mythology, the Cyclops is a deformed, ugly outcast who's become dangerous because it's been outcast. And the Cyclops is also interesting because it, it's thought that it may have actually been inspired by people finding the skulls of elephants. This is an elephant skull up here. And it's thought that people might have misinterpreted this big hole where the trunk connects for the huge eye of a deformed giant. Now this is interesting for me because you know, this monster embodies a social idea. And I did this illustration to sort of uh, hint at how this monster also embodies our human experience of trying to interpret <coughs> the things that we find in the landscape. We now know, of course, that this is the skull of an elephant, and there's all this soft tissue that attaches to it that alters its look. So when we reconstruct prehistoric animals nowadays, we're trying to always improve our reconstructions as we find new evidence as our understanding of the world we live in changes, so too do our reconstructions. And so to illustrate, give you a better idea of how creating prehistoric monsters embody scientific ideas, I'm going to talk about this little monster. This is Aquilops americanus, the little horned dinosaur that Andy Farkey was just talking about. And not all monsters are big. As you can see, it's, it's a little tiny skull. It's about, it's about this long. And the whole animal was probably about the size of a chicken. And here you see Dr. Andy Farkey, who was just in here. He's holding this little skull next to, here's the skull in his hand. He's holding it next to this huge, bizarre monster. Now, this is, this is a Centrosaurus. It lived in North America, uh, I'm not sure, I want to say like 20 or 30 million years after Aquilops. Aquilops is this tiny little creature that lived before all of these big, weird, horned monsters were living in North America. And although it may look very different at first sight, there's some key details that tell us that they're actually related. Specifically, they both have this curved beak in the front of their mouth. They also have these specialized teeth for chopping up plant material. And coming out of their cheek, they've got this triangular cheekbone that was basically like a horn coming out of the side of their face. They've also got these expanded bones in the back of their skull that make a frill. In Aquilops, the bones are there. They've just been crushed down to the other side of its head. So you can't really see it in this photo. 
but it's got a much smaller version of this frill. And then this thing has a massive horn on the front of its nose. The Quillops is also interesting because it doesn't have a massive horn, but on the tip of its beak, it's got this little nubbin right here that no other horned dinosaur that we know of has. This little, this little like bump on the tip of its beak, which may be the beginnings of these animals evolving weird horns and protuberances growing out of their faces. So now that we know what it's related to, that can help us fill in some of the gaps because as you can see, it's a little bit crushed. So we want to figure out how to uncrush it, how it should look in three dimensions, like before it's squished. And all we have of Aquilops is this one little crushed skull and the lower jaw. So we know we have a pretty good idea what its head looks like. But what should the rest of it look like? Well, when we look at the dinosaur family tree, we can place Aquilops at the base of the family tree that later gave rise to Centrosaurus and Triceratops and all those big horned dinosaurs. Now, this is a very, very ridiculously simplified family tree of dinosaurs and the archosaurs they're related to. Um, as you can see here, they branched off. Dinosaurs, family tree branched off. All the blue is dinosaurs, by the way. Their family tree branched off from their common ancestor with crocodilians about 250 million years ago, so a really long time ago. And so the only members of this section of the tree of life that survived past this mass extinction 66 million years ago are crocodilians, they're only very distantly related to Aquilops, and modern birds, which are a little closer, but still, they, they separated from Aquilops a really long time ago as well. So Aquilops and the other Ornithischian dinosaurs, that's this big branch, it's called the Ornithischians, they really aren't very much alike anything alive today. We don't have any really close relatives alive today, so we have to look at things that we call analogs. An analog is something that lives a similar lifestyle, even though it's a different animal. So when we look at the relatives of Aquilops, we can start to fill in some of the gaps. Now, Aquilops is the first member of that family we found in North America, and it's about 107-ish million years old. And we don't have any other things like it from that age in North America. All of its relatives are these Asian creatures that are similar to it. This is Archaeoceratops. They actually have this skull cast here at the museum. It's really, really similar to a Aquilops. It's a bit bigger, and it's coming from Asia. This is Liaoceratops, also very closely related. And this is, uh, this is Auroraceratops here. Now, these things tell us some interesting things, because Aquilops lived in an environment that's given us a lot of great dinosaur bones of larger stuff, but a Aquilops is only the size of a chicken. Now, if you want to become a fossil, you need to be buried in such a way that your body isn't ripped apart and jumbled and destroyed before some parts of you can be preserved. Now, we're really lucky because some of Aquilops' relatives from Asia lived in environments that preserved their bodies in great detail. In the case of uh, all of these ones, they lived in this environment that had a lot of sand dunes and sand storms, and they got buried by collapsing sand dunes and by swirling sandstorms. Often got buried while they were alive. So we find them in their life position, hunkered down, hiding from the sandstorm. And so you get the whole body, beautifully, well, the whole skeleton anyway, beautifully preserved. Now, one of the other amazing environments that preserves great fossils is in Liaoning, China. And this is a close relative of Aquilops called Cetacosaurus. And as you can see here, the whole body outline and the skin impression and everything is preserved in incredible detail because this animal died in a lake where volcanic ash, super fine volcanic powder, was settling in the lake, kind of like concrete. And it was settling into every nook and cranny of this animal and preserving its remains in amazing detail. So when you look closely at it, you find some awesome stuff. You, you get the scale impressions. You also get traces of the melanin. That's the pigment that gives you freckles and dark hair and, and, and gives a lot of animals dark splotches and stripes and things like that. And all these dark spots are remnants of the melanin pigment that was in this animal's skin. Melanin apparently has carbon in it, and that carbon actually stains the, uh, the rock if it's preserved in this environment. The other thing that's really amazing is you get some scale variation. You get these knobby tubercle scales. You also get sometimes preserved the horn 
that covered that triangular cheekbone. Now, animals that have horns, they don't have bones sticking out of their head, usually. There's, the, the only things that have bones sticking out of their head are deers with their antlers. All these other animals that have horns actually have some stuff covering the horn called keratin. It's the same stuff that your fingernails and skin and hair are made of. And when you have a lot of keratin that's really dense, covering a bone, you get a really strong structure. The other interesting thing made out of keratin that's been preserved in this fine volcanic ash are these long, almost feather-like or hair-like quills. They're something like a feather, but without the, the fluffy stuff coming off of the sides. And this is really interesting because it tells us that these little bipedal early horned dinosaurs that would later give rise to all the huge weirdos like Triceratops and Centrosaurus, they had crazy soft tissue adaptations that allowed that they were, you know, allowed them to survive. So what were these adaptations for? Well, it's hard to say, you know, for sure, but when we look at this larger family tree, this is all those giant weirdos that evolved in North America afterwards. We see that they're adapting their frill and horns in crazy, crazy ways. Now, a quillops would be way down here at the bottom of this family tree. This is the, what we call the crown group. It's the stuff that lived at the end of the age of the dinosaurs. And this is a little girl right here. As you can see, she's tiny. These are huge. These are giant bizarre animals, way bigger than that little aquilops skull. So why were they adapting their soft tissue in weird ways? Well, a clue might be in this family tree where we see them adapting their horns and frills in crazy ways. When we look at their family tree and we look at the larger tree of life, we see similar things going on in the family trees of other animals. Here we have chameleons and other lizards. A lot of chameleons and other lizards have weird horns and stuff growing out of their face. What are they doing with those? Same with ungulates. Uh, you know, this is, these are, uh, I think these are kudu. Antelope and deer ungulates are growing weird things out of their head. And what are they doing with them? Same with hornbill birds. All of these animals are using these structures for two main functions. Displaying, in other words, showing off in order to attract a mate or to intimidate rivals. And they're also using them for combat, usually combat within the species. They're competing with other members of their same species for territory and breeding rights. And um, occasionally they use them to defend themselves from predators as well. So when we were reconstructing the quillops for the paper and press release describing the specimen, we incorporated these science ideas into our prehistoric monster reconstruction. In order to get a better sense of what this animal should look like, we had to also look at the environment. These are fossil plants from that same rock layer that Aquilops was found in. It's in a rock formation called the Cloverleaf Formation, about 107 million years old. And what we have is something, we have some plants that are really similar to plants that are alive today. These are the needles of a tree with cones that are almost identical to modern redwoods. So if any, have any of you been to the redwood forest here in California? All right, so on the coast of California, we have the coast redwoods. The fog comes in off the ocean, and they have really expanded feather-like needles for catching that fog. They actually absorb water through their leaves. And then if you go to the Sierras, you'll see giant sequoias with, ne with these smaller needles like this. And in the Sierras, we have lower humidity, so the trees have smaller needles to conserve moisture. So we have something closely related to redwoods living in a bit drier of an environment. We also have these ferns that are closely related to modern seed ferns. And then this plant is one of the earliest flowering plants. Flowers at this time, 107 million years ago in Montana, were just starting to take root and evolve. This, is, this leaf is kind of amazing because it looks super similar to a modern mugwort or ragweed plant. So if you go hiking here in California along the creeks, you'll find leaves that look very similar to this. They grow along the creeks. They're a fragrant, herbaceous flowering plant called uh, mugwort. It's all over California. It was, it or something very much like it was growing 107 million years ago in the realm of dinosaurs. So when we look at all these plants and the environments they grow in, we can come up with a modern analog environment, a modern environment that has similar conditions to the environment that a Colossus is living in. And this is what we get. We get an open uh, a redwood or a sequoia forest 
with lots of ferns covering the ground. We have ferns types that may have actually grown up in the trees. And um, it, this is a coast redwood forest, so this is a bit moister than, than what we find in the Cloverly Formation 107 million years ago. But the basic architecture is there. Giant trees, spaces in between them with lots of undergrowth for small animals like a crops to live. But what else was living in this environment? 107 million years ago, Montana and these forests that were living at the time were filled with a bunch of bizarre monsters. So this is Dr. Andy Farks outline here. He's pretty small compared to these other things. And a Quillops is super small. And if you look at the rest of these animals, it's a scary world to live in if you're this little chicken size, the Quillops. You've got to contend with Deinonychus, a raptor the size of a wolf with the appetite of a golden eagle. It was probably eating lots of little things every day in order to keep itself going. Then you have huge meat eaters like this Acrocanthosaurus. Uh, I didn't have a picture of Acrocanthosaurus in my talk, so I drew one on the board here. This is about the size of the actual skull. So while this thing might not eat a chicken-sized animal unless it's really hungry and it's easy to catch, you gotta remember, this is gonna make eggs that are about ostrich size. And those little flesh-eating terrors are gonna hatch out possibly by the dozens. Big Mama Acrocanthosaur can carry a lot of eggs in her belly. And so this environment is going to be filled with this terrifying Big Mama Acrocanthosaurus, scary little babies. And then everything else in this environment, all the plant eaters, are just beyond comprehension. This is what was browsing on those huge redwood trees. This is Sauroposite, and its neck would have hit the ceiling here. This is a huge animal, one of the largest land animals that's ever lived. It is not going to look where it's stepping. I mean, it's going to look out for big things that can injure it, but it's not going to care if it steps on a chicken size the Quillops. So if you're a Quillops living in this environment, you really got to be careful where you live. So one of the things I do as a paleo artist is I talk with the paleontologist, and we, we discuss, OK, where in this environmental space is something like a Quillops going to eke out a living in a world full of Deinonychus and full of other meat eaters like this one? This one's really special because it's a mammal. This is Gobi Conodon. And that name means the, uh, the cone-shaped tooth from the Gobi Desert. It's another animal that has relatives in Asia. Again, this is indicating that there's a connection between Asia and North America at this time that's allowing even small animals to come over into North America. And its teeth are terrifying. It's got four fangs in the front of its top jaw. It's got two little vampire teeth in the bottom here. And then all these teeth in the back are just these nightmare teeth with multiple cusps on them that could just shred anything up. They were probably eating anything small enough that they could get their jaws around. So if you're a Quillops living in this environment, how do you avoid getting stepped on? How do you avoid becoming a nice meal for a Gobi Conodon or a light snack for Deinonychus? You gotta be careful in this environment. Um, so one of the things we talked about was camouflage. Now we've got an interesting thing going on because a Quillops has, it has this little frill and these little horns and this little nubbin on its nose. So it's got some things that are looking like they're going to be display features. Certainly they're display features once you get to those big, weird horned dinosaurs at the end of the age of dinosaurs. Those things weren't camouflaged. Their heads were like the size of this table. They can't hide those very well. But at Quillops, we wanted to incorporate some camouflage and some display coloration. And when we look at modern animals that are about this size, living in this kind of environment with weird things growing out of their faces, we see a mixture of things. We see things like this guinea fowl who's like, I don't care if you see me. I'll jump up into a bush. I'm going to have bright blue and red on my face so I get all the ladies. Um, bearded dragons will hide in burrows. Um, road runners, they, they do an interesting thing because they're mostly camouflaged, but then they have this awesome streak of blue right behind their eye. They have exposed skin there. Um, this is a Boyd's forest dragon, and it has weird prickles and stuff. And these things are camouflaged. This is a, a sheeny sorted lizard. It is also, it's got this interesting coloration. It's like kind of camouflage, but if it were to come out in the open and start showing off, it could also work for display as well. So we came up with a whole bunch of different color schemes. Dr. Andy and Matt Wadel, who was also working on the project, they liked this one, and so that's the one we developed. We brought all this data together, and 
we, uh, you know, thinking about, okay, if you're an animal that's like kind of brightly colored and kind of camouflaged, where do animals like that live? Well, I was walking around the redwood and sequoia forest, and this is what I came up with. This is my Aquilops fortress. It's a, it's, a, it's a pile of roots. When one of these falls over, you get this awesome splay of roots. And one of the things that little animals like lizards with bright blue sides and, uh, and you know, cool display features who are also kind of camouflaged, they'll hide in amongst the roots. And there's even like a small mammal, bur mammal burrow in here. So little animals are using these structures today to hide themselves. So we thought that would be a cool thing to incorporate into our illustration of a cool op. So I, I actually just copied that stump. I put my flip flops on it so I could get a decent idea of the perspective and scale. This is our sub-adult that cool ops. It's not fully grown because the skull we have is one that we're, we don't think is fully grown yet. We've got some speculative adult aquilopsis and baby aquilopsis. Based on what we learn, the science ideas that we learn from its Asian relatives about how they grow, how their skulls change as they grow. We've got Gobi Conodon, our little nightmare mammal, jumping out of the prehistoric ferns to try and catch a baby aquilops. While this guy is kind of on like sentry duty, maybe squawking to let the other ones know, hey, guard the burrow with your knob beak heads. There's a scary monster outside. So that's one possible interpretation. But it's not the only one. Again, these science monsters embody scientific ideas. And there's multiple ideas about how this animal might have lived. One idea that we could have gone with was to go more in the direction of camouflage. Acrocanthosaurus here, big bird-like eyes. Uh, the part of it, the part of mediating dinosaurs' brains that manage visual acuity is big. Deinonychus, very, very bird-like. They had excellent vision. So perhaps we could have gone more like some other modern animals with spikes and horns growing out of their face. This is a horned lizard. And these spikes and quills and prickles and things do something other than just display and defend, although they defend too. Notice how this guy's outline is uneven. These animals' spikes and prickles and quills break up their shape when they're hiding in the undergrowth. This is an awesome chameleon that has a little nose nub, not unlike what a Aquilops has. And these guys, the males, will push each other on a branch, they'll have little fights with these. But these weird ruffles and stuff, they work for two, they're multifunctional. They, are for display, looking cool, showing off, but also they help break up the shape. They make it look more leaf-like, and it blends in. A great example of this, this is a coast horn lizard. You can find these here in Southern California. Look at how well his outline just disappears into the sandstone that he's crawling on. Again, these spikes, they also are defensive. When you bug one of these guys, they actually inflate their body with air, and all those little prickles are pretty sharp. And then they've got this little frill that's, it's, again, it's multifunctional. They can display with it. They can also defend the back of their neck from getting pecked in by a roadrunner with it. So there's another possibility for what was going on with Aquilops. And so I've actually created a new reconstruction of Aquilops for this talk. It's never before been seen. This is a, a paleo art science monster debut right here. And it's this. How many Aquilopses can you find in this painting? Oh. All right, should I give you guys the, the, the answer key? Yeah. Is there four, five, or six? six? All right, here's the answer key. So we got a big mama Aquilops or dad Aquilops here with spines covering its back. We got a little baby right here also sitting still, kind of like a chameleon, just holding still in the undergrowth. Got another baby emerging right here from the undergrowth. We've got two babies here, and what are they drinking out of? What's this? A footprint. It's a big footprint from something like an Acrocanthosaurus. A big meeting dinosaur walked through, left a big footprint in the squishy mud by a lake or a creek, and they're carefully, they're cautiously emerging from the undergrowth to have a little drink, and then probably scurry back into the undergrowth to avoid becoming a snack. Now I want to show you one other thing. So why, why do we try and create these different reconstructions of animals to communicate these science ideas? Well, this is why I think this is important. Check this out. This is that skull wall I showed you a few slides earlier. This is down looking at the floor. 
And these represent branches in family trees. Now, Aquilops is the oldest member of the horned dinosaur family that we've yet found in North America. It's not on this family tree, so I added it and its relatives with the power of computers at the bottom here. And as we go up the wall, we see branching and more branching. And these branches represent a lot of change. These are family levels. And when you get up to the top, you see this crazy diversity of huge, bizarre, horned monsters with giant frills. They've expanded those bones out of the back of their head. They've got all kinds of arrangements of horns. And these are all families. This isn't even all, this wall doesn't even have all of the skulls that have been found. They're finding new ones all the time. And remember, if you want to become a fossil, you need to die and get buried somewhere really good for preserving fossils. So there's a whole lot of evolutionary development going from Aquilops to Triceratops. There's the one everybody's heard of up there. And re remember, this is a, a skull that's like, it's huge. These were very successful animals. And the reason it's important to study them is because their biology is related to how we understand how our Earth works. So when we study their bones and we study the geologic record, and we look at what plants were growing at this time, we start to piece together a picture of how our planet works. And that's really what this is all about. It's about understanding this circular spaceship that we're all flying through the cosmos on. Because one of the things that we see is that we see a lot of adaptation and change and extinction, especially in times when there's sudden shifts to how the planet is going. At the time that Aquilops came to North America, there was a, a period of climatic fluctuation, which allowed the, there was changing sea levels, animals were coming over from Asia, and then they got isolated in North America. In isolation, they, have, they evolved into all these bizarre creatures. They were very successful, but something had to have happened to open up that niche for them. And then, when suddenly the Earth's chemistry suddenly took a shift 66 million years ago because of a meteor impact, there was a sudden, startling change in the climate and the chemistry of our planet. And so when we look at this broader picture of life on Earth, we start to see that perhaps what we need to do as a culture is learn from these animals and learn from the history of our planet so that we don't cause a sudden rapid shift that wipes out animals that were successful for many, many millions of years. Thank you guys very much for watching and listening. You've been a great audience. If you want to support my art, I'm on, this is my website, don'tmesswithdinosaurs.com. I'm on Patreon. Um, and just a heads up for the parents, I'm a crazy artist. I make a lot of weird stuff, not just dinosaur stuff, so don't send your kids onto my crazy website without checking it out first. I'm on Twitter at Greg Griffin. You can search for Brian Ng Paleo Art on YouTube and Facebook. I've got videos describing some of my creative process. Um, so yeah, thank you guys very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the talk. And uh, do we have time for questions? Yeah, we do. We do. All right.